Hey everyone, I want to welcome you back to another episode of Tandy Town, and in today's episode we're going to be talking about the Buffett formula. So I know this is something that, um, right off the bat, a lot of people go like, oh great, here we go, very old boomer way of looking at the equities market. Um, but I want to explain um, why this is come to be something that I have adapted and began to really implement in my life. And I'm going to show you guys exactly how you can do the same. That way you can build a portfolio that you know is actually with filled with stocks that are mathematically undervalued in relation to the price that they are currently at. Um, you know, I've, I've talked about it a little bit on Twitter in the past month or two, but I've really in the last couple months kind of lost my desire to speculate, right? It's, it's one thing to try to find a setup that looks good from a technical standpoint. And I'm not saying technical analysis doesn't work or anything like that, but it's a lot of effort and it's a lot of uncertainty and it's a lot of worrying and questioning yourself and dedicating a lot of time and I'm just not in a position anymore um, being in my senior year of college and, uh, you know, trying to develop more of a social life and really just being able to enjoy um, everything outside of financial markets more. Um, it, it just put me in a position to where I realized that I don't have the desire to speculate much on anything anymore. And there's not necessarily a problem with that. If you are somebody that does enjoy speculating, I personally just don't want to dedicate the time commitment to speculating in the way that I might have once had. And so I'm developing, uh, you know, trading strategies, whether it be through Theta and uh, portfolios that don't require a time commitment to it. That means if I want to stay up and play Xbox with my friends, I can do that. That means if I want to go out for a round of golf, I can do that. That means while I'm in class, I'm not fretting about the market, something happening in the market where I don't have the ability to pay attention to it at a certain moment in time. It means developing a, I don't want to say strategy, I guess, but a formula that allows you to be able to either trade, um, but more specifically invest with confidence, knowing that you don't have to perform within a certain window and knowing the actual value of an asset. Now, just because I've started to feel this way a little bit more strongly doesn't mean that I am a non-believer of cryptocurrency. It doesn't mean that I'm a non-believer of your favorite stock, although it does mean that I'm less confident probably in that. Um, the point of this isn't to necessarily shame anything, right? The point of this and the point of this podcast is always to be to introduce ideas to people um, that they might have not considered on their own. And my job isn't to try to make anybody rich. And my job isn't trying to, um, you know, make anybody well off by having them emulate whatever success that I've had in my life. Um the purpose of this podcast has always been um, just trying to introduce ideas to people that make them think a little bit differently. That doesn't mean that, um, you know, they have to adapt everything that I say or that everything I say is even right. Um, you know, a lot of things are going to have differing opinions. But what it does mean is I just want to introduce more of a methodology into presenting people with the different things and experiences that I've learned in my time throughout the financial markets to where people, if they feel that something's missing, if they feel like they want something to change, uh, whether it be from a financial standpoint, whether it be from a time commitment standpoint, uh, whether it be from just a general happiness or ease of um, you know, finances in life, that's what I want to do. I want to be able to present ideas to people that allow them to not have to necessarily have to implement this one strategy of scalping cryptocurrencies on super low time frames for 18 hours a day in order to be able to not have to work a nine to five job because arguably at that point you would you might not even would uh you might even prefer working a nine to five job at that point um so the point of this and the point of uh, my financial goals, at least personally, 
um, has always been to try to develop ways to make money that don't necessarily have a heavy time commitment. Uh, when it comes to selling premium, that takes me about 15 minutes a week. Um, developing a portfolio takes a little bit more time. Um, but in today's episode, I want to focus more on that investing, that portfolio type thing. Um, as somebody that has grown more anti-speculative um, in, in recent months than, than the majority of my time in financial markets, um, the reason that I've grown anti-speculative is because I've realized how much easier um, the game of investing um, of, of remaining discipline and remaining patience becomes when you actually know the underlying value of an asset, right? So when you are speculating on something, whether it be cryptocurrency, stock options, or even shares on a company like Tesla, basically what you're doing is you're trying to predict the market psychology of other people and other participants in the market. And what you're trying to do is make a somewhat informed decision that more or less people are going to take your side of the trade and that's going to push price either in favor of you or against you and when you're wrong you're trying to limit the risk that that has now that's a very difficult concept um, especially because speculators aren't necessarily looking at the actual asset that they're purchasing what they're looking for is will somebody pay more for me can i sell it to somebody for more and so that becomes a very difficult game because at the end of the day, you really don't know if other people are going to um, enter and, and purchase your asset or sell your asset. And it becomes this kind of, um, you know, coin, like slightly better odds than a coin toss type of thing if you know what you're doing. And that's just not a game that I have necessarily enjoyed playing for the past couple of years. Uh, you know, I made some decent money speculating. Um, I don't think it was necessarily uh, anything to do with intelligence or skill. I think a lot of it just had to do with the luck of a strong bull market. And, um, you know, now that I'm a little bit more experienced and a little bit more humbled and trying to think of ways not necessarily to make exponential returns but to think of ways to ensure that i keep the money that i have made during a bull market um, for when bad times come so that i have capital to deploy when everybody is caught off guard or um, you know i'm invested in things to where when the markets inevitably do turn to the downside at some point in time when you know it's it's rather inevitable whether it be eight years from now or tomorrow um it's really important to me to know and have confidence in my assets because if i enter an asset that i'm trying to speculate on and the market turns and the asset drops 30 to 50 or 80 percent then i don't really have any incentive to keep holding the asset and i don't really know if or if not i should hold the asset because i don't know the underlying value behind the asset so i wanted to show you guys this because this is uh, gurufocus.com um, and this is an incredibly useful website that i am going to use to be able to describe the buffett methodology and this is going to be a, an incredibly useful and free tool for you guys to use to build a portfolio using the same methodology and um so the the methodology is is fairly simple it sounds complex if you've never took like accounting before or anything but essentially what buffett's methodology is is he likes looking at the balance sheet and the income statements of of uh companies and i know right off the bat you're going oh my god i don't even know how to read that i don't even know what that means you don't have to with the thanks to this website the great thing about this website is that you're going to be able to um not have to do that it's going to give you all the numbers that you need in order to effectively evaluate whether a company is um, overvalued or undervalued using warren buffett's principles which are when warren buffett looks at the income statement or the balance sheet of a company he's not looking for the earnings right because eps is based off ebitda so if you've ever taken accounting ebitda stands for earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization essentially what it is is that companies can use the depreciation write-off or interest rate write-offs and they can mark it as a cash asset on their balance sheets and essentially what happens is it kind of boosts the assets on their balance sheet which in a hypothetical way boosts the earnings of a company 
um, before they actually use it as an expense. Um, Warren Buffett does not like EBITDA for that reason, because at the end of the day, it's a temporary cash asset on a balance sheet. But you know that as soon as that 10K or 13F or whatever form it is that I think it's a 10K that companies have to file in order to post their earnings, uh, you know that once that's posted, eventually what is listed as a cash asset, a uh, cash asset under EBITDA is going to have to get paid out through as an expense through depreciation and interest. So it's not a real asset and it's a way to artificially boost earnings. And that's not what we want to look for. We don't want to look at artificial numbers. The thing that is great about equities is that you can look at the free cash flow of a company. And free cash flow is basically knowing without that you know, boosted EBITDA number, how much cash a company is earning per share of the stock. And when you look at the free cash flow and you look at the real earnings, what you can do is then assume that the company is going to grow their earnings at a rate that is backed by their previous history. Um, I think it's great to look at a minimum of 10 years, ideally 20 years, if you have that kind of, um, if the company's been around that long, but minimum of like 10 years and what you can do is you can uh, create conservative estimates of how much cash you should be able to pull out of the company in the next 10 years and then what you do from there is you discount at a certain rate the value of the cash flow in those uh, future years and you'll be able to effectively value the value of the company at its current point in time uh, considering um, and, and, and have a generate a price target based on the future cash flows of the company. So Guru Focus is an amazing website because it does all of that math for you. And what you can do is you can either look at the companies that you have in your personal portfolios right now, and you can use this ticker to know immediately if your company is overvalued or undervalued without having to know any form of accounting. So you're welcome. Your nineteen ninety nine a month is about to save you a hundred thousand dollar MBA business school, uh, you know, degree. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go through some companies, uh, and mind you, free cash flow means that the company has to be profitable, right? And and this is an important point too because in in this kind of bull market right now, you have a lot of people that are being rather stupid. And what I mean by rather stupid is they're investing in companies that aren't turning a profit and they're investing in these companies for the long term. Now, that doesn't mean that a company can't um, become profitable in the future. But often when you are looking at companies that are unprofitable and they're growing their revenue at a high rate, um, they still the stocks, especially in a market like right now, start kind of pricing in the profitability of a company, you know, 10 years in the future. And that's a very dangerous route to go down because it's very possible that the stock can go sideways for 10 years until the earnings actually reflect the current value of the company. So we don't want to invest in companies that aren't turning a profit. Um, the reason for that is because it's not always about what you buy it's about the price that you pay, right? And Warren Buffett has this famous saying where he says he'd rather buy great businesses at fair value than mediocre businesses for dirt cheap. And what he means by that is you want to is you want to make sure whatever company you're purchasing, they have some sort of edge, they're some sort of leader in their market, they have promising future cash flows, and it's priced rather fairly. If you look at Tesla right now, that's a fantastic company, but the prices that people are paying for Tesla right now are light years ahead of where they're earning of of time to where it's going to take for those earnings to actually catch up to reflect the value of the company, and that's exactly probably why Michael Burry is shorting it, who is a um, also a Buffett uh, Charlie Munger type of person when coming to evaluate the value of financial assets. So we're going to go through some companies right now, just as an example, and I'm going to be pointing out what companies have promising features that are currently undervalued in relation to their profitability, specifically their free cash flow, so that you know whatever happens in this market, whether it roars higher or, where, or whether it nukes, that the price that you pay today 
is currently lower than the future prospects of the business. And you can bet for sure that if that is the case, then eventually over time, you are going to see the returns that sh that are equivalent to the free cash flow of a company. Um, you know, there's a reason that the equities markets typically double every 10 to 12 years, or excuse me, every eight to 10 years. And the reason for that is because companies are usually growing their cash flows, free cash flows between eight and 10% a year. So the market, people think it's this all knowing, um, you know, economic machine and the Federal Reserve is behind it and they are manipulating it in a certain way to, uh, you know, prevent a economic collapse and whatnot. And that's just nonsense, right? The market doesn't care about economic health, rather that the earnings of companies give an indication of the overall economic health of the United States government. And um, and, and as the you know GDP as a whole. Um, so what we have to do is we have to focus on the free cash flows of the company. And the free cash flows of the company are going to give us indications about the future prospects of the business. And as long as this free cash flow is continuing to increase and that the value of the business um, you know, is, is growing or the business is actually growing stronger, then there actually isn't much of a need to worry about um, interest rates or what the Fed is doing or somebody's uh, hawkish or dovish or if you should buy gold or Bitcoin or whatever it is because, you know, the U.S. dollar is going to collapse. All of that to me is kind of a bunch of nonsense and it's a bunch of rationale for people to try to explain why the market goes up and down because they don't really understand at the foundation what it means to be an investor. If you were to, if somebody were to offer you today a McDonald's franchise, but you take a look at the McDonald's franchise and the McDonald's franchise is losing 5% a year on its free cash flows, are you going to purchase the McDonald's franchise? No, you don't want to buy a business that isn't turning a profit. And I don't understand why people don't have that same approach to stocks. Stocks are businesses. They're not vehicles that are Ponzi's, right? They have actual tangible book values that you can calculate using the right formulas and using the information provided by the companies when they present their earnings. So to think that you wouldn't purchase a McDonald's franchise that's losing five or 10% a year, but you would purchase Uber stock is a bunch of bullshit. And so I'm going to be breaking down some of the companies that I have recently found um, that have really promising futures based on their future free cash flow. Um, which also tells you that a company is not only durable, it tells you that they are competitive, tells you that they're leader in their field, and it tells you that they're going to continue to grow their profitability, and I can't think of better things to invest in than that. So let's get right into this. I have to start it out with Tesla, though. Tesla is just everybody's favorite company, and you know you have a lot of people right now that are basically saying, it doesn't really matter what price you pay for the companies you want, you just have to buy your favorite companies. And that's not true. I think you should buy your favorite companies. But that doesn't mean paying a price to where what you're paying now can net you negative or negative returns for the next five or 10 years. What it does mean is you have to look at the free cash flows of the company, you have to look at the future prospects of the company using that um, growth rate when it comes to the cash flows of the company. And then you can effectively evaluate whether you're paying a fair number for the company or not. So we're going to get started and we're going to uh, first evaluate Tesla. So this is why I am not an advocate for purchasing Tesla. Does Tesla have great technology? Yes. Do I think it's going to be a promising company? Yes. Do I think it's going to be the most valuable company in the world someday in 20 years? I think so. Yes. But does that mean I want to pay for Tesla right now, giving their current earnings potential? Absolutely not. So we're going to go over here, and you're going to go onto the Guru Focus, and you're going to come over here to where it says DCF, and that stands for Discounted Cash Flow, and this is the method that we want to use to evaluate the fair value of a company. So you're going to come over here, and if you click EPS, it's going to give you that EBITDA fair value. So that's not what you want to use. You want to use FCF, which stands for free cash flow. And what we want to do is, um, you know, Tesla hasn't been public for 10 years, so there's no, there's not a lot of data in relates to how their free cash flow looks. Um, I think it would be safe to say that they're actually growing closer to 20% a year. 
And for the terminal stage, what we want to do is you want to use 6%, okay? So usually you're going to look at about 7 to 8% for any normal American company, but we want to be conservative here. The goal isn't to necessarily try to create the highest fair value possible. Our goal is to create the, large, the most conservative estimates that we can with a large margin of safety because that means that your RR for going long are safe, you know, if they are safe from a conservative estimate, which means that you're basically uh, making an estimate that is going to be lower than reality, then, um, and, and you still get a green thumbs up that there's a good margin of safety, well, that means that you can probably expect even better returns than what you analyze at this current point in time. So looking at this, we can see that Tesla's currently valued at about $103 a share for its free cash flow. It's currently trading at $785. This is not a company we want to own because in the event that there is a market mean reversion and cash flow starts mattering again, um, then you know, you're know you looking at a possible you know 80% loss on this company, which is exactly why Burry's betting against it. So we do not want to invest in a company like Tesla. Now let's look at some of the Fang names, okay? So Fang, you know, Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google, Amazon, um, you know, these are companies that people are arguing are propping up the market. They are arguing that um, there's too much market share that they are holding up the market, that it's making it a Ponzi, that they're 25% of the S&P 500, and that um, the uh, spread of the overall weighting of the market is not good because all of these companies are overvalued. So let's take a look at Apple, which is an incredibly cash-rich company, and Warren Buffett has 40% of Berkshire Hathaway, uh, which makes up his net worth in Apple, and let's find out why. Okay, Apple, for the past 10 years, has been growing its um, is free cash flow about 16%. To be a little more conservative, we're going to make it 15%. But we also know that a 4% growth rate over the next 10 years is is rather uh, low prospect. So we're going to bump this up to 6 as I mentioned. And we'll see that even today, Apple is undervalued. Its current free cash flow um, based on the future cash flows of the company um, should value the company at about $177 a share, right? So while people are screaming their head offs about how Apple has gone up, you know, 4x in the past like two years, the company is still undervalued. And, you know, that means that people are going to try to short Apple, they're going to say that the market's overvalued, whatever, but they're actually not even looking at the free cash flows of the company. And the free cash flows tell you that the company is currently greatly, not greatly, but it's currently undervalued. It's rather fairly priced. And, you know, this is a great business. It's why it's the number one business in the world as far as market capitalization is because it's such a cash rich company. Now, let's look at a company like Facebook. This is a company that I have been very publicly bullish on and for good reason. Okay. Facebook owns Instagram. They have an incredible um, you know, platform when it comes to advertisement, and you look at these numbers here, and they're very, very promising. So Facebook, when we look at the free cash flow of Facebook, um, what you'll find here is that it's also, it, or it's deeper undervalued than Apple currently is, and that's great for me because the stock is already 15% off the highs, where it was at 380, where the margin of safety wasn't as good as it previously was. Now you'll notice here that for the past 10 years, the free cash flow growth has been about 50%. Okay, but we don't want to use that 50% metric because I don't think it's likely that uh, this company is going to become a $5 trillion company in the next like 10 years. But within the past five years, which is a more conservative estimate, it's been about 23%. So 20% growth rate over the next um, starting right now is a fairly conservative estimate. And then the terminal growth rate, we want to bump up to 6%. That gives us an almost fair value of $500 a share. And with it currently trading at 330, we have a good margin of safety here to know that if they continue to grow their cash flow at this rate, which you will see right here, right? And we look at the um, about a year of cash flow from um, Q2 2020 to Q2 uh, 2021, we'll see there's a consistent growth of cash flow. All right, let's look at some of the other FANG names. Let's look at Netflix. This has been popular, par particularly um, in the past few years, uh, because they've been pumping out great content. But that doesn't necessarily mean that Netflix is trading at a relatively good uh, value if we look at this f discounted free cash flow. Um, 
so Netflix is obviously a company with high um, with high uh, earnings, right? Um, they pretty much just became profitable within the last year or so. Um, but this isn't a company that's cash rich. It's very expensive to um, produce these types of content on a mass scale. Now, I think a lot of those investments are going to start paying off. I think when you produce some great shows like Squid Game or La Casa de Papel, um, you know, you earn the subscription of your members for at least a few years because they're going to have this expectation that that is what um, the type of content that you're going to deliver. And they will willingly pay 20 bucks a month or whatever to uh, wait for another show like that. Um, but like I mentioned, when we look at the free cash flow of this company, it's not a very cash rich company. It is a company that can um, grow uh, at a rapid rate as we look at this EBITDA here. But when we actually look at free cash flow, um, it's not incredibly valuable. So this isn't a company that we would want to own. This is actually similar to Tesla when it comes to a rather horrible margin of safety. Um, so next, we'll take a look at Google, and I think this is going to be a good example. Um, Google, very profitable company, um, and they have a history of growing their free cash flow um, on a rather consistent basis. Um, so this is what I mean, um, and this is what I'm going to use an example for when Warren Buffett says, paying fair value for a great business instead of um, you know, a mediocre business that's undervalued, right? So Facebook is currently about fair value, you know, give or take a percent or two. But Facebook is a tremendous business. There's not going to be another search engine that ever takes over Google. Um, they also have a ton of um, startup foundations where they're, you know, working with Waze or, or Waymo to create self-driving cars and all this sort of stuff. Um, and, and, you know, this business is fairly valued at 2840. Um, but this is a great business, and this is something that basically tells you, hey, this company's fair value. It doesn't mean it's undervalued, but it does mean that it's, it's priced fairly in relation to the growth rate of its future cash flows, and that you can probably expect that it's going to continue to do the same thing. So you can buy a great business like Google at a fair price instead of paying uh, you know, a mediocre price, or excuse me, paying a great price for a rather mediocre business. So we'll, um, we'll look at maybe a mediocre company like General Motors where they have a lot of competition, they went bankrupt, uh, they're not necessarily impressive or make better cars than Tesla, um, but they're priced really, uh, or excuse me, Ford, not General Motors. We'll look at Ford, right? So this is something that I recently posted on Twitter. Um, so Ford has been around for a very long time. They don't make exceptional cars. Um, they grow their free cash flow at an okay rate. Um, and currently, when you look at their fair value, uh, currently trading at fifteen dollars, there's seven to seven hundred to eight hundred percent upside. If we are actually talking about their future prospects of free cash flow, and there's a lot of people that go, "Whoa." Ford is super undervalued. I need to buy this company. But when you look at it, like Ford isn't a, spent a spectacular company. I mean, when I think of cars, right, Tesla comes in up top and then, you know, obviously comes Toyota and Honda. Ford, buying a Ford is like buying a last resort car. And even though this company is in relation to their cash flow, is trading at a low valuation, the company isn't as competitive as some of these other companies. So this is actually one that I would probably stay away from, even though even though it's fairly priced, right? Even if we make this number conservative, we take this growth rate from 11% down to 7%, right? It still gives you four to 500% upside. And I don't think the company is in a bad position, but this is, Ford is not a company that I would own want to own outright. Porsche is, right? BMW is. Ford is just not one of those cars that people flock to, and I don't really care what the free cash flow is if the actual foundation of the company isn't competitive and doesn't have a durable competitive advantage, regardless of whatever the free cash flow is. Um, you know, and you can you can look at this from other your some of your other favorite companies. Starbucks is one of my favorite companies on this planet. I just love their products, but when we look at their free cash flow, right? 
this is not a company that I want to be holding at this current point in time, right? Even if we make this free cash flow 8% and this one's 6%, there's still a lot of downside. I love Starbucks. I would like to own the company outright, but I would want to do it at a price that's reasonable. And, you know, according to this, it's going to be about half off. My girlfriend's favorite company, Target, right? Women love nothing more than Target. Um, but when you look at a company like Target, that is a very cash-rich company. It's growing at 13% a year that you can conservatively guess is going to do 6% a year. It's currently trading at 229 but you know its fair value is 345 This is a buy. This is a company that you want to own. It's competitive advantage. It's one of the best places to shop. Um, they are a super cash-rich company. And... Um, you know, even by conservative estimates, you can bet that Target is undervalued. Whereas, you know, Costco, another great company, has had a massive run in the past couple, um, in, in the past year or so. And there's a lot of people wondering if they should be betting on uh, Costco at this current point in time. Um, sorry about this free trial thing. Hold on, let me refresh the page. Why is this not working? Sorry about that. Anyways, looking at Costco, even though this is a fantastic business, even though they make a lot of money and they grow their free cash flow at a good rate, when we look at it over the past 10 years and, you know, its future expected value, Costco's had a massive run in the past year. Just in the past six months alone, it's basically rallied from its basically free uh, fair value over here at 360 all the way up to 450 now the expected returns have to be less than this now costco is always a company that is traded at more of a premium compared to target or walmart or whatever you want to call it but this is just not the right price it's a fantastic business but it's not the right price so when you're building your portfolio you have to look at these companies that are cash rich super profitable and or at a fair price um, and you have to look for competitive advantage, even though Ford is very undervalued compared to its free cash flow. It's just not a stellar competitive business. So that's a company that you say no to. You look at Home Depot. If you want to buy anything for your home, where do you go? You go to Home, you go to Home Depot, or you go to Lowe's. Both of those companies are very rich. Um, but when we're, I would argue that Home Depot is probably the favorite. And when you look at it from a perspective of the free cash flow, Home Depot is undervalued. Its fair value is about 423. But you come over here at Lowe's, which is arguably runner uh, runner up in that sort of uh, duopoly business. Um, you know, it's a little bit overvalued. It's not incredibly overvalued to the point where um, you know you should consider selling or anything like that. Um, but it is you might be paying a smidgen more and. If you are going to purchase now, you should just expect um, slightly lower returns in comparison to the Home Depot stock. Um, and I just want to reiterate before I finish this episode, this doesn't mean that I think if you've held Apple for the past 10 years or Amazon or Facebook or Tesla or whatever, that you should sell it because, um, you know, obviously there's a tax obligation that comes with that. And if you've owned those businesses for a long time from a lot lower prices, it doesn't mean you necessarily always have to sell them. Uh, now, if I own Tesla, I would probably sell, given how incredibly overvalued it is compared to its free cash flow. But it doesn't mean that you have to, right? You don't want to create a burden. This is more so that if you want to build a long-term portfolio, which I think everybody absolutely should, well, then you need to be able to effectively evaluate whether a company at this current point in time, where most of the market is trading above, uh, which which you can deem as pretty overvalued, um, you want to make sure that even in a market where everything is mostly overvalued, if you can find businesses that are currently cash rich and are undervalued, then you have to know that when bad times come, they're not going to do as poorly. And when good times come, they have a lot of catching up to do. And that's just going to pose for great returns. So I hope this episode was insightful. If it was, make sure you feel the need to share Tenny Town with somebody who you feel needs to hear it. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I'll see you in the next episode.